Good. Okay. Uh, yeah. So I'm this guy, and I'll uh, give you an overview on cardiovascular image processing and, and functional analysis methods. Uh, I have these disclosures, but not really related to this particular talk. Uh, so we have three learning objectives this morning, and the first one is to understand how to acquire uh, excellent cardiac images, and then we'll work our way through these other learning objectives as we go. There is, of course, lots of good online information about this, uh, some very good uh, sort of review articles and position statements from the SCMR. SCMR has done a, a pretty good job over a number of years of putting together information that's helpful for uh, putting together and designing your own protocols as well as providing guidance on uh, consistent image processing within your, uh, within your own uh, institute. And I'll comment on some of these uh, aspects as we go. Uh, kicking off with what makes, I think, a good state-of-the-art uh, balanced SSFP uh, protocol, the key here being that, of course, we use balanced SSFP. Every vendor has a slightly different name for this, but this is sort of the preferred bright blood method for evaluating cardiac function uh, at the global level and looking at valves and, and gross anatomy generally. Uh, in terms of spatial resolution, the rule of thumb is 6 millimeter slices with 4 millimeter gaps or some, some uh, a total of 10 millimeters, so sometimes 7 plus 3, uh, and about 1.5 by 1.5 millimeter in plane gives you uh, pretty good quality images. Temporal resolution, of course, the higher the better to a certain extent, except for, of course, that has an impact on overall uh, breath hold time. Uh, it's certainly nice to get 30 or 40 images per cardiac cycle, uh, but depending on your scanner and the exact setup, you may be closer to 20 or even 25 uh, uh, images per cardiac cycle. And I'll comment on some of these imaging parameters as we go, but obviously for most patients, we're trying to limit the breath hold duration to, you know, maybe 8 or 10 seconds per slice, uh, and I'll talk about the various slices that we'd be acquiring as well. Uh, one thing that uh, didn't get really explicit attention until relatively recently was sort of a precise or optimal choice of imaging flip angle for balanced SSFP, and the reasonable guideline for that now at one and a half T is about 75 degrees. So uh, as with many things in MR, it's not always the higher is the better. Uh, there are oftentimes optimum choices, and for cardiovascular applications, about 75 degrees at one and a half T is good. Uh, so moving right along, let's talk about some of the uh, protocol parameter choices that we have to make. Uh, one of them is bandwidth, and bandwidth is uh, usually a little bit of a more mysterious imaging parameter to choose, but it is something that you, uh, you can choose on your protocol. If you choose low bandwidth, you're frequently going to get these sort of flowing uh, artifacts, which of course degrade overall image quality. And the bottom line, or the rule of thumb, would be use the highest available bandwidth for your system. It has a pretty limited impact on overall signal to noise. Uh, you could approach some uh, peripheral nerves stimulation limit, so you may have to back off a little bit, but we typically are acquiring it certainly over 1,000 hertz per pixel. Uh, different manufacturers have slightly different terminologies for their bandwidths, but uh, I, would, I would suggest that the highest you can get away with is, is likely to be the best. Uh, following on that, uh, other things you have to pay attention to are whether or not you have a good shim. When you have a bad shim, image quality is poor. You can usually place some kind of a shim box over the heart, improve the overall field homogeneity, get an optimal shim, and of course that improves the overall uh, image quality. And of course high image quality is important for our qualitative assessment, but it's really going to be especially important for a quantitative assessment and image processing of these kinds of images. So our general guideline is to use a uh, patient-specific gradient shim. Uh, it's also important with this sequence to do a center frequency scout. So the center frequency that's used for the RF pulses during excitation can be uh, sort of at the correct frequency where you can uh, identify that there's very uh, little in the way of overall flow artifacts uh, or off-resonance artifacts. And if the fre center frequency is shifted in the, say, downward sense or in the upward sense, you can get image uh, quality that's quite poor. You may, on your first uh, swipe at this, get images that look something like this, and a center frequency adjustment can bring you back to having nice high quality images. So different manufacturers have this implemented in different ways, but being able to adjust the center frequency can do a lot to overall improve your image quality as well. Uh, lastly, of course, something that we encounter all the time is respiratory artifacts. We have patients that can hold their breath to varying degrees, uh, and in the case of not holding the breath at all in a free breathing acquisition, you can get uh, certainly non-diagnostic image quality uh, in images uh, that uh, uh, will need to be repeated. Uh, one option, one very easy option that's available all, on all scanners when this is a problem is simply averaging. It's not great, but it does work. Uh, so four averages obviously extend your acquisition time. Overall image quality is not 
not fantastic, but they are still usable, I would say. Now, there's a lot of other more sophisticated ways of getting much more higher quality images, uh, but they're not necessarily as widely available in all systems and in the same implementation with all uh, manufacturers. Uh, and of course, we can compare this to what we prefer, which is a high quality uh, breath hold image. So another option on some systems is actually real-time imaging, where we're acquiring the images fast enough and reconstructing them fast enough that we can actually just evaluate cardiac function while the subject is free breathing. So you can see anterior chest wall motion as the patient is breathing. And so this is a, this is a potential. Uh, and in terms of uh, image quality, you can get acceptable image quality. These images were, in fact, at 3T. Uh, you can get pretty good in-plane resolution. Uh, you'll have to use high parallel imaging factors to do so. Uh, but in in general, the overall image quality is relatively compromised, and in fact, the post-processing here becomes non-trivial because these images are just a, a stream of maybe 100 images during a respiratory cycle and cardiac and various cardiac cycles, and so a lot of post-processing software doesn't really let you easily pull out the image that you need to perform evaluation on. You just have this stream of images rather than a series of images that are periodic and synchronized to the cardiac cycle. So real-time imaging is, is, is an option, but it poses some post-processing challenges. Uh, if we look ahead at some other possibilities, this is another example of real-time images acquired, uh, a, a series of 207 images. There are some really sophisticated image processing methods now, image reconstruction methods now, that can take a stream of real-time images, pull out the data that's during, say, a particular respiratory cycle, and re effectively re-bin the data to give you a nice high-quality cine image from that real-time stream of images. And this is what I call the acquire in real-time, figure it out later approach that was really pioneered by Peter Kelman at the NIH. And there's various ways of actually implementing this. I won't get into too much detail about it, but the bottom line is that you're taking your real-time imaging data, you're also simultaneously recording some respiratory data, perhaps from the bellows, perhaps from the images themselves. You're recording the ECG and using that physiologic information to uh, interpolate and distribute and bin your case space information uh, for each individual coil and then FOIA transforming the, the case space data for each coil and combining those coils to ultimately get you this, uh, this uh, acquire it uh, now, figure it out later uh, kind of images. I think this is an approach that you're likely to see on the scanners uh, you know, at, at some point, but because the development cycle is relatively long, it could take some time. Uh, but a really nice approach. So these are just some more example images of, you know, what the image quality can look like during a breath hold. And in fact, sometimes the image quality is even improved with the so-called real-time free breathing approach. A lot of those artifacts can average out because they're inco incoherent over time. Uh, so these are just several sample images of that approach uh, working uh, well, at least in my opinion. Uh, we're looking at this for pediatric applications, but it's also nice for uh, generalized applications where patients can't hold their breath well. Uh, so perhaps, I don't know, maybe it's coming to a scanner near you. Uh, so let's talk now more about the actual image processing aspects of this uh, and learn some best practices for quantifying global RV and LV uh, images. Again, uh, there are good position statements and guidelines coming from the SCMR about how to uh, approach this. Uh, and the bottom line is when it comes to image evaluation for global function in particular, it's really semi-automated with manual correction is still the gold standard, which is to say we don't have a fully automated approach for doing this, which is really too bad, uh, but it also speaks to the difficulty of, of, of that challenge. Uh, and a lot of times we're just uh, simply evaluating the short axis view and using Simpson's method, which is the stack of disks, where we're contouring on a bunch of uh, different slices from the base of the heart through to the apex of the heart, and then adding up the equivalent volume with each, when, within each blood disk, if you will, to get a final uh, volume. And perhaps you're using some interpolation method and, and smoothing that in some sense or not. So again, uh, probably something largely familiar to most of you. Uh, we can draw these epicardial and endocardial contours. Uh, doing this both at end diastole and end systole to get the information that we need to evaluate global LV function. We can get things like LV wall mass. Uh, we can get things like end diastolic volumes, end systolic volumes, and perhaps stroke volumes or cardiac outputs. But really the thing that's measured the most frequently is the ejection fraction. Uh, and it's just done by so-called planimetry in general. 
Uh, we can do, of course, the same thing for the RV, so draw another set of contours. Uh, this can be done either on this conventional short axis stack, which is probably the most frequent thing uh, because those images already exist for having evaluated the LV. There is some literature suggesting that other views could help improve the accuracy and precision with which you can evaluate RV functions. So that's something to consider if you really have an RV-focused uh, evaluation for a patient. Uh, and of course, by drawing those contours and getting estimates of the blood pool uh, volume, you can again make the same measurements, uh, usually the most common being the, the end diastolic volume uh, and systolic volume in the ejection fraction. Uh, of course, there are several challenges when doing this. One is the base to apex through plane motion. Uh, you have to choose which of these, uh, you, we've acquired, say, several short axis slices from the base uh, through to the apex, and they may not all be necessarily included for overall evaluation. Uh, I would say that this slice here is too basal in some cardiac frames, and you may or may not include it, uh, certainly wouldn't include all cardiac phases in your evaluation, and that perhaps this slice is just right. Uh, the guideline for us is that we look for the LV to be an annulus in all cardiac phases, uh, whereas here you can see the LV myocardium is disappearing out of the plane because there's so much uh, through plane motion at the base of the heart, about 10 millimeters, uh, depending, of course, on the subject. Uh, so be consistent with a study. Within a study in an institute is the most important guideline so that your users are doing exactly the same things and you have well-chosen uh, guidelines uh, for consistency. That's especially important for longitudinal studies where you're following uh, patients and, and the development or progression of disease, uh, and it's also important uh, just overall. Some other considerations uh, about this, or actually, so looking forward again at some uh, possible newer approaches, uh, there are so-called uh, guide point modeling methods that track the base of the heart and track the contours. There's still some manual editing in this, uh, but the idea is they're pushing and pulling and warping sort of a three-dimensional model, uh, which I think is a nice approach for getting at LV volumes. And then you can do some more uh, feature tracking-like uh, applications where you can use those same Cine images to actually help surgeons understand uh, mitral valve dynamics and dimensions and things like that, perhaps prior to mitral valve surgery. So there are some uh, really neat approaches that are uh, maybe emerging here still. Uh, one of the real challenges or something that you have to consider at your institute is whether you're, when you're contouring the endocardium, whether you're going to contour in such a way as to include the papillary muscles and trabecula in the blood pool, or you're going to take a much more detailed approach and trace around uh, you know, the coast of Norway here uh, to include the papillary and trabecular uh, muscle tissue into the LV mass itself. Uh, this is a fast, reproducible uh, approach, but in some sense it's inaccurate because you're calling muscle uh, blood. Uh, and this approach is uh, appealing in that it's accurate, but of course it's more time consuming for a user. Uh, I think most sites probably default to this approach here because uh, mostly because time is money. And if you're consistent with in, within an institute, uh, that's going to be the most important thing for uh, interpreting your, your studies uh, uh, through in your clinic. Some RV-specific challenges uh, that we should point out. The RV wall is, of course, very thin, so that makes estimates of its mass quite uh, tricky. There's also the conus arteriosus, this area here just below the pulmonary valve uh, that's a, sort of uh, a conduit for blood flow. It's part of the ventricular blood pool, uh, but it's, uh, it's, it's a, it doesn't contribute a lot of function, uh, if you will, and different institutes include that in different ways. There's also a lot of large, there's a, a large through plane motion here for the RV. In fact, even more through plane motion typically for the RV than the LV. So you have to be very careful about, you know, what slices you're including for the evaluation of the blood pool because you don't want to be inadvertently including uh, left atrial or right atrial volumes in your ventricular volume analysis. Um, and then there are also some additional challenges with trabecular tissue and the so-called moderator band, uh, which uh, similar to the papillary muscles and trabecula on the, on the left side uh, that make uh, the analysis a little bit tricky. And then lastly, the epicardial lung contrast can be relatively poor. It can actually be very difficult to see the RV wall itself. We can see the blood pool, but it can be difficult to see the wall. And so that takes quite a bit of experience to get just right, especially if you want RV masses. Lots of advanced approaches that I think are emerging. This is an angiographic approach uh, through the con administration of a contrast agent being used here in the, for off-label purposes. Uh, but with some simple image processing with you know, sort of off-the-shelf uh, packages, there seem to be some really appealing ways of actually getting at LV volumes and RV volumes. Uh, and again, these are still kind of emerging applications, but uh, could greatly simplify the workflow for getting at uh, these kinds of values.
So the last thing we'll talk about in, in uh, just about a minute here is how we determine the value and methods for quantifying regional cardiac function. So what we were talking about was global before. Let's talk about regional. Ejection fraction is the main global function, but it's relatively insensitive and nonspecific measure of ventricular function. So looking at regional measures can be good. Typically, this is done from the cine, and the clinicians will score things on a scale of being, you know, akinetic or hypokinetic. And we can see, for example, uh, a wall region over here that appears to be akinetic or at least hypokinetic. Uh, but that's a qualitative way of scoring. You could potentially measure a wall thickness change, so pick a thickness at end diastole and a thickness at end systole and calculate a wall thickening change. Uh, that, of course, uh, typically requires some manual uh, 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 intervention to acquire those numbers. Uh, cardiac tagging is another possibility. It's been emerging for a long, long time, and it is a, an appealing approach, especially for those interested in studying uh, very nuanced aspects of cardiac function. There are tagging uh, patterns that come in various flavors as well, but the bottom line is that the tag tracking analysis uh, uh, is still uh, typically pretty time-consuming. There are some commercial packages that address this, but it's still relatively time-consuming. You can ultimately get strain maps, for example, so you can evaluate circumferential strain or some other measure of region regional function through acquiring this kind of data, uh, but it still remains relatively time consuming to do. There are other approaches. This is what's called the cine dense approach. Dense encodes the displacement and the signals phase. And the advantage of that approach is this is the cine image and we can map on top of that an actual displacement map with a, just a little bit of image processing. Still requires some manual processing. And in the same example of a patient with a myocardial infarction, we can see very clearly that there's a, a distinct wall motion abnormality in this region over here. So conclusions and some existing challenges for you guys. Uh, the acquisition really needs to be more point and shoot, and that was that kind of acquire in real time, figure it out later approach. It's a pretty robust and reliable uh, approach at one and a half T, but three T is really challenging. The analysis remains imperfect and fully automated approaches are really needed, both for global RV as well as LV function. And while regional function is really interesting, we still need validated biomarkers and guidelines for quantitative regional wall motion ass assessment for a variety of different indications. So uh, if you're looking for project spaces to work in, I think these are some really interesting uh, application ideas. And with that, I'll say thank you.